not a different definition of what it's saying, but I, what I feel is a simpler way of saying what James is saying. And it simply means this, let patience be brought to its end, that you may be brought to your end, leaving nothing behind of experience and faith, so that you may be triumphant in Christ Jesus. And that's what that word teleos or teleos means. It means to come to an end. And every test we face, it can have either a positive or a negative effect. And it's based on our will. It's based on obedience or disobedience. Mm -hmm. So what happens is a lot of times in trials, and I'll use myself as an example because you guys seem to have everything together. What happens is in a trial, when we fail the trial, and we keep falling in the trial, we come to a disappointed mindset where we feel that we can't be victorious. And it beats us down. But what we fail to do is we fail to look at the root cause of our failure. All right? Yes. So when we, don't, when we look at the outcome and not the root, it causes us to be depressed. But when we'll find out what the root cause of our failure is, we can find ourselves being victorious. Amen. I remember when I was dealing with my drug addiction and I kept falling and I was trying. That was really strange to me because I was trying with everything I had. But the problem was I was not being obedient to the will of God in my life. That was the root cause of my failure. See, we just look at the failure. But we don't look at the cause. What's causing me to fail? Yes. Why am I always finding myself in this dilemma, in this trap? And it's because, in my case, it, I wouldn't obey what God told me to do. Mm -hmm. God would say, go to church. I would say, what? No. Come on, talk to me. Don't get quiet on me. I would say, yeah, I would. No, I'm not going to go. I, I don't see any benefit in that. Mm -hmm. God tells us to do simple things. I think of what he said in Habakkuk. He said, write the vision and make it plain. He said, because the day is going to come that when they run, they're going to read it and they're going to remember that God proclaimed this in our lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, when, you, when you take a vacation as a pastor, you really don't get a vacation. You sort of get away from everything. But it's still running in the back of your mind. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Because you have the concern of the saints. You guys can look at me and you can think, and, and I'm telling you, you can think, but don't you think for a minute that I don't know what's going on in your life. Amen. I'm not a mystic or uh, some uh, somebody who's deep like that, but God talks to me. Amen. Amen. And I know you don't want to hear it. I know you want to look at me and make it seem like you've got everything going on good in your life and you give that persona that everything's fine. Man, throw that stuff in the trash and get the victory. Amen. 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 And look at what's really the cause of your falling. Why do I keep finding myself in this mess? There's a root cause. So that's Amen. what the tests are designed to do. The tests are not bad. Think of it. James tells us, he says what? Count it all joy. That's how he starts. He says count it all joy. When you what? Fall into divers temptation. Many different sh shapes and sizes. Trials of various sorts. He says, be glad when it happens. It's going to show you something about life. Amen. It's going to show you something about yourself so you can be triumphant in Christ Jesus if you yield yourself to the will of God. Now, he goes on. Now, I can preach this this morning because it's in me. Now, you can go on and he goes on and he tells you if you lack wisdom to ask of God, who gives freely, he uses the word liberally, who gives freely. If you ask him, he'll give it to you. And when you read it, you put it in his perspective, you say, well, if you're letting patience come to its end, and I'm coming to the end in my patience, how then could I lack wisdom? Here's what God does. We can, we can be patient in a trial. Uh, and I'm going to use an example maybe we talked about. You can, be, you can be patient in the trial. You can let patience have its perfect work, but you can lack wisdom because you function in your own. Amen. God tells you to do something that doesn't make sense to you, so you know what? You do what you want. You, you came through the trial all right, but you failed to uh, apply the wisdom of God compared to the wisdom of man. Amen. 
Because the, God uses the weak things of the world to confound the might. Amen. Amen. That's the way he works. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So then he tells us, he says, now, if you ask, you've got to ask in faith. Yes. Now, I, I've been reading this, studying this thing. you got to ask in faith. What do we say faith is? What's the Emmanuel Temple translation of faith? Full acceptance of God's word as being true. Amen. That, that's my definition. Full acceptance of God's uh, uh, word as being true in my life. Okay, so hold it. Now, he says, if any man uh, asks, let him not waver. He tells you don't waver. You know what he's saying? If you, if you ask in faith, Fully accepting that God's word is true. When he answers you, what? Yes. You've got yes. to do it. Amen. You've got to do what he says. And then he says, but if not, a double-minded man is what? Unstable. In all his ways. In all his ways. Forget the all his ways. Let's just get you're unstable. Amen. You're just unstable. So you're not going to get it right coming or going. Amen. Because you didn't ask in faith. You asked from a standpoint of James 4, oh, I can preach this morning. You ask from the standpoint of James 4, you're asking to consume what you want upon your own lusts. You're not at, well, you know what James is saying? He said, you're not asking for the right thing. You need to ask for victory and you need to get to the root cause of your failure. Amen. And when you get to the root, you've got to do what God tells you to get rid of it. And then once you get rid of it, you can be triumphant. I want to be triumphant in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't want to hit and skip and miss. I want to be triumphant. It, it feels good to be in victory. Even if I'm suffering, crying in the midnight hour, it still feels good to know that I'm in God's unchanging hands and I haven't thwarted his purpose in my life. Amen. Amen. Come on, Sister Brianna, and you can finish this. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. It's funny that he said all that because my title is Learn How to Fight. Amen. Amen. So, um, if I was going to give you a subtitle, it'll be Inviting Learn How to Trust God. So, if I was to find fight, it would be to strive or contend for victory in battle or in single combat to attempt to defeat, subdue, or destroy an enemy. And you may say, well, why fight? Why care? Well, because eternal life is at stake. Time is winding up. And we're not just fighting for ourselves, but we're fighting for our loved ones to be saved, our friends, our spouses, and we're ultimately fighting to see Christ in peace. Amen. If you will turn me to Daniel chapter 1. And while you turn, I'll pray. Lord God, I thank you for allowing us to be here today, Lord God. I ask that you get your message out, Lord. And I don't know hold anything back, but I give out what you've given me, Lord. I ask that I decrease, Lord God, as you increase in me. And that your purpose today, Lord God, is fulfilled. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashkenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes. Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, in whom they might teach the learning in the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And to whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. 
But then a purpose in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And in verse 8, I thought that it was it was a serious verse, and I feel like we often read past it, but Daniel purposed in his heart. And I know that it was temptation to eat some of the king's meat. And when I saw the word defile, I wanted to know what it meant. And it means to make unclean, to render foul or dirty. So Daniel, he didn't want to be made dirty with the king's meat or the king's drink. And he, Daniel trusted God to sustain him because, I mean, I know the food looked good. And they're in these bodies of flesh, so I know the wine probably smelled great. The best chicken, the best turkey, whatever food they had, it was the best. So he had a purpose in his heart that he wasn't going to eat. And I feel like that is a very important verse. Amen. Amen. So in verse 9, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sword? And then shall you make endanger my head to the king. Then he said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs hath set over Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children I eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, your countenance appeared fair and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. So Daniel trusted God and used faith. And part, and part of learning how to fight is having faith. Amen. Amen. So Daniel trusted God and he used faith. And he knew that he had to fight back the thoughts that may have came, that I know came about eating of the food and the strength. And in our sense today, we'll be trusting God in our marriage, just having faith that God's going to work things out even though we don't see it. Or if on our job, we don't enjoy our job, but we got to trust God that he's working something in us. And even in church, you know, we have many trials here, many trials there. But ultimately, it's like we have to have faith that God's going to work everything out. Amen. And in Hebrews eleven six, we know that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So, turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to be doing a little jumping around today. So in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Then was Jesus led up of his spirit into the wilderness, wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward in hunger. And when the tempter came to him, and he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thou self down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things I will give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt thou shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So in this passage, we see that Jesus used the word to fight off against Satan. Amen. He didn't just walk away. He didn't just say, By Satan. But he used scripture to defend. He used verse 4 when he said that, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. In verse 7, it is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And in verse 10, Give thee hence Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So in this, as much as we have to have faith, we have to also have to use the word of God to fight. So it's more than just you know saying to ourselves, Well, I can handle it, I can handle it. But we got to trust and have faith in the word of God that he can bring us through. So... In Romans 8, 37, even if we get to ourselves, it's like, man, all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. 1 John 4, 4, 
Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome me, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So we have to use the words to fight against the things that come where the, the battle's in our mind, the battle's in, you know, inside. Whatever the case may be, we have to use the word of God and have faith that it's going to work. Amen. Amen. And, um, and even in Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And we have to keep that in mind on our jobs because sometimes our managers can't get the best of us. Amen. And we want them, sometimes you want to hit them, but you can't because you need your job. But we have to remember that <laughs> that it's not it's not the person, but it's the spirit behind the person. Right. We can't right. allow them to deter us from witnessing to them and spreading the love of God to them. Right. So it's like God got into a body and then showed us how to use it and how to fight. Amen. 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 So, and if you're talking to me with Daniel chapter six. So Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius to set up the kingdom 120 princes, which shall be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give account unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the, the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find against him concerning the law of God. Then the presidents and princes assembled together to the king, and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute, and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god, or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of the lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it may not be changed, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed, and gave thanks before his God, as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled a found man praying and making supplication before his God. So I think that in verse 10, it didn't say that Daniel just went down and kneeled and prayed. But at the end of the verse, it said, as he did a four time. So we knew, we know that Daniel was a prayer. And like my dad often says, we often find struggling and praying one time a day, and then this man prayed three times a day. And prayer is going to help us in fighting. Because if we don't have a relationship with God, we're not going to have anything to stand on. We're not going to have any foundation, and we're going to be shaky in our walk. Amen. Amen. So Daniel was already praying, so when things got rough, he, he didn't back down. When you're praying and you're already fired up, I'm sure God had already prepared him for it. Because if you're praying three times a day, the Lord is going to be speaking to you. And he's going to be preparing you for stuff that may come. So in this case, Daniel, like I said, he knew that the writing was signed, and he went directly to his house, and he started to pray. So in this, in praying, Daniel was able to prepare himself for what for what was to come. And he needed it being thrown into the lion's den. Amen. So, and um, we know as the scripture goes on that he ends up getting thrown in. But in Proverbs 16, 7, it says, When a man's ways pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And so at the end of this verse, we find out that Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den. The lions don't attack him. Um but and he didn't complain in it either. But he, you know, he prayed through it. And then we know that the people who accused him got thrown in and they got eaten up. But um here we see when things got rough with Jesus, because of Satan was tempting him, he didn't cave, he used the word. When the three Hebrew girls rebelled against the king's food, they didn't cave, they had faith in God. Amen. And when the attack came upon Daniel, he didn't complain, he continued to pray and fight through the accusations. So here we see different examples of people who did stand in the midst of trials using prayer, using the word, and having faith in God. But what's the result of not fighting? Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. So in 2 Samuel 
Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbi, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned into her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. So we often look at, look, look at this scripture and we think, well, you know, David, you know, God says David has a um, you know, heart after mine. And we often get upset with David, but we do some of the same stuff. And so we see in this, you don't really see, oh, well, David prayed about it. Or David consulted such and such. David just seen it and he wanted it. Amen. And so we get the same way. We on Netflix, we see a movie, we see it, we want to watch it. We see something, we don't have the money to buy it, but we want it, so we buy it. Amen. And we do, and then we get upset and we say, well, God, you know, I'm broke, I need the money, but we didn't consult with God about that. You know, we make decisions, we make rash decisions, and we don't think it through. Mm -hmm. So the result of this is quite horrible, but we do some of the same stuff. We get upset with David because of what he did, but we function in some of the same things. Amen. Yes. Um, and I'm sure that when David did this, he was like, you know, it's just going to be one time, no baby. Um, and I'm sure he didn't know the impact that would be created from him doing this. Yes. And so it's crucial for us when we're making decisions that we consult with God before and that if we're praying as we ought, that we don't make decisions like this. And so we know that, you know, the devil tempts us with the uh, lust of that flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And if we know that's how Satan gets us, we need to work even harder to fight against that. So turn a couple books over to 2 Samuel chapter 13. Verse 1 says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom the son of David had a fair sister, whose name was Tamar. And Ammon the son of David loved her. And Ammon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin, and Ammon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But Ammon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. And he said unto him, Why art thou being the king's son, lean from day to day, what thou not tell me? And Ammon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. So here, Ammon did the same thing that David did to Bathsheba. He seen something he wanted, and he wanted to have it. And he pulled the strings he needed to get what he wanted. Whereas David seen what he wanted and tried to cover it up by having Uriah in front of battle. Here, Ammon's going to pretend to be sick so that uh, Tamar can come in and, you know, assist him and get him some food and stuff. But both of them were trying to get what they wanted. It was the same path. So here we see that David didn't set a good example for his son um, in doing this. And um, so in this... The thought caught, crossed Ammon's mind about Tamar. He should have prayed, but instead he entertained the thought. When we do some of the same things, we know that we're supposed to cast down all imaginations, but sometimes we let little thoughts trickle. We let them stay in our mind. You know, you think on them for a little while, but we shouldn't do that. Because we know that those things can manifest and then turn into something that, you know, we can't control. And before you know it, you're acting on these thoughts that you once thought was no biggie. Mm -hmm. So... Moving along, turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. We're going to be starting at verse 18, Genesis 37, verse 18. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. This is talking about, I should explain. This is talking about Joseph and his brothers, his 12 brothers, the sons of Jacob. And this passage of scripture explains that. Verse 19, they said one, one to another, Behold, this dream will come. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will come of his dreams. And Reuben heard him, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. 
And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass, when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishma Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spice, green balm, and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh, and his brethren were content. Then there passed by Midianites merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. So here we see that the brothers allowed jealousy, hatred, greed to work in them, and to ultimately overtake them. And I'm sure Satan was playing in their minds like, oh, you know, y'all see y'all dad, he don't love y'all, he loved Joseph more than he loved y'all, you know, he never loved y'all to begin with. You know, playing in their minds and they allowed these thoughts to manifest to the point where they wanted to sell, well, first kill him, and then, you know, end up selling his brother. So it's just like stuff like this, how we allow thoughts to work in us. And I'm not taking up for, you know, Jacob because he was wrong in what he did, but the sons were wrong too. They shouldn't have even thought about wanting to kill their brother, let alone sell him. And um, so the same stuff, like I always say, the same stuff works in us, but it shouldn't have any place in the house of God that these thoughts, you know, well, I want him out of the church. I want him out of the church. I don't like how he do this. I don't like how he do that. We do stuff like that, and that creates discord in the body. Amen. Amen. And so then we find out that, you know, we can't pray like we ought to, or the services aren't going the way we want to, but it's because we have little, many, uh, little, many issues in different places. Like Pastor Keep always says, the small foxes are what's destroying the vine. So we have little stuff working in us, and this little stuff can become big stuff. So we have to fight against that. Mm -hmm. And we know that if we have all with our brother, we should go get it right. But instead, we allow stuff to simmer, and we allow it to sit there, and before you know it, we're walking out the church upset, we're mad at this person, we're mad at that person, but how we dealt with the situation, that wouldn't have happened. Amen. So when we don't fight, we disappoint ourselves. I mean, it's like we know to do better, we know what the word says, but yet we still function in it. And we disappoint the body. We out of whack. We can't function on one accord. Like Taylor prayed this morning, we're not unified. Because this is going on and that's going on. So not only are we disappointing ourselves, but we disappoint the body. Because we're many members, but one body. Amen. And then, ultimately, we disappoint God. He's hurt. You know, it's like, what's going on? You know, you pray to me, you talk to me, but yeah, you allowed us to go on. You tell me that, you know, you ask me for strength and ask me for, you know, uh, faith in this area, ask me for patience in that area, but then you do stuff like this. You don't get it right when you know you're supposed to get it right. And then it's like, I'm dealing with you on it, and you're still not getting it right. So we disappoint God in that. And we have the Holy Ghost, so we know how to use it in order to get the victory. But yet we allow it to sit down, and we sit it down on the chair, and we say, you know, you can sit right there. Well, I'll handle this. But yes. instead, you know, and then we end up messing stuff up. Amen. Amen. And so, um, in that, and then we set the Holy Ghost down, and it's just like the devil will come with something, and he'll wrap it up so nice. And it's like a nice wrapping paper, a great bow. And, but inside this present is death. Mm -hmm. And it's like, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus, Jesus Christ our Lord. The grass is not green on the other side. And I often look at it as um, in the interrogation rooms, when there's the room where the pro you know people can see inside, but the person inside can't see. To me, I feel like that's how Satan is. It's like we're sitting inside that room, and he can see all different angles. And all we see it is from one side. So we thinking on the other side is better. It's it's good, you know. This should be better than the situation I'm in, but it's death on the other side. And be very smart of us to not try and go on the other side and find out what's over there. Amen. Amen. So how do we fight? We have faith in God, the word, and prayer. We see these different examples. And it's not a worldly fight where you using fists and blows and cursing people out. You know, oftentimes uh, growing up, you see, you know, girls fighting. Some of us have participated in the fights. And in this, you know, your cousins or your sisters, they might try to teach you, oh, you know, you got to do this, you know. Put your leg out so she can trip and fall. Well, you know, <laughs> grab her hair, pull it down. You know, they tell you this different stuff, but you never know until you get put in that position how your body going to react. You know, for the guys, you know, put you keep your set up. You know, they teach you how to fight. They teach you how to do all this stuff. But you never really know until you get put in that situation how you going to react. 
Amen. But in the Bible, the Lord has listed all the things we need. Everything is from A to B. This, if this happens, this is what you do. That happens, this is what you do. So we're not in this walk alone. We have this book that's telling us exactly how to do everything we need. We're not by ourselves in this fight. You know, we're not saying, well, my auntie did tell me to do this. And then my sister told me to do this. But in the Bible, it's all composed into one. So turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So let's put on the arm of God, have faith in God, use the word, pray, and go to war with Satan. Amen. 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 Praise God for that word. Amen. Amen. It's nothing like teaching us how to fight. Because we you know that we're in the last days. Amen. Yes. And and the Lord has given us instructions, like she said, on how to fight. I mean, what weapons are we to use? But one thing you got to have to be able to use those weapons is you got to have faith. Mm -hmm. If you don't have faith, you're not going to use the weapons that God has given us to use to defeat the enemy. It goes back to being victorious in every aspect of our life. That's what we want. <coughs> so are you here today? And you, you just don't want to, I mean, sometimes we could be in a battle so long that we think that the sword of the spirit don't work anymore. But it still works. The armor Amen. is the good armor. Amen. The helmet of salvation, the, the breastplate of righteousness. I mean, all these things that's in the word is still able to keep me mm -hmm. from falling and to present me faultless before the presence of his glory. Now, that's what I'm striving. I'm striving not to fall. I want to be knocked down. Amen. But if I fall, I know that the word of God can restore me and Amen. pick me back up. Are you here today? Maybe you maybe you caught up in a fall. Maybe you trapped up. Amen to God. And sometimes you can be caught up and trapped up and you think that the well, man, this armor don't work. Mm -hmm. But amen. Well, now we know that we need to cast down that imagination. Because that's the lie from the devil. But 